thank you very much for joining me. My name is Mitko Karshovsky, and a lot of people see my name and they often say it looks scarier than it is. Like people expect there to be like a silent letter in there or anything like that, but it, it's what it reads like. So Karshovsky. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to actually put that down for me being sick and just recovering with COVID and I'm going to use that excuse today. Sorry about that. <laughs> So oh, perfect. Mikko perfect. actually approached me about being on the podcast because he actually runs a podcast that's centered on remote as well. And you've been running that for about four, four years now. Yeah. So we're wrapping up three and starting year four here very soon. Okay. And the podcast is That Remote Life? That Remote Life. That's right. Yeah. We have almost 200 episodes and we talk a lot about like I mean, the podcast is called That Remote Life because when I was starting it, I didn't really have a niche. It was like, I want to talk about this subject and a lot of the different things in this area. And so it's literally like we talk about the remote life, all parts about it, business, future of work. We talk with like digital nomads and discuss all areas of that world. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's how I started with mine. It's like I wanted to talk about the future of work. I didn't want to go backwards, right? But I definitely don't ever want to go back to the office or <laughs> in the way that we always did at the office. I will talk about hybrid and I do think that there's value of in person, but I don't think that the office is going to be the center of what the work has always been. So that's how I started mine as well. So I was asking you briefly before we started recording to talk a little bit about the work that you did before as like a a head of operations, head of remote. You worked for a digital agency, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So it started out just as like a freelancing thing where my career history is very much like I can do a little bit of everything. Like I'm dangerous. What is the word? I know enough to be dangerous in a lot of different things. <laughs> and so I yep. started out, I started out doing for like small agencies, I would do a lot of different things for them, right? I'd come in and, oh, you need a website built for a client. I can do that. You need to do the copywriting. I can do that. I can do a little bit of design. Like I can do a little bit of everything. And when I dropped out of college, I spent some time in the startup space and really like honed those skills. And then I started doing the freelance work, but I really liked working for one company and that position kind of grew. And at the time I was also trying to get very interested in like remote work and how to make remote work kind of concepts. And the founder of that agency approached me and said, hey, we need someone to like figure this thing out for us because they were growing very quickly. And so in 2017, I started working with them. And then 2018, I essentially started spearheading this idea of how do we take this? How do we make, like, how do we figure out how to function at a high level remotely. And so I dove into that and it was this idea of, I don't really know what the answer is, but let me dig in there and, and try to figure it out. So that's how I got started in that space. So it was a global company that stretched across time zones, but you didn't necessarily have a lot of structure in place yeah. to guide that. So I think we were 15 people spread out over 11 different time zones. I did the math ones, but I think that don't quote me, but I'd say that was like within a, a solid, uh, within an acceptable margin of, of error. With that many time zones. So was the focus really actually building out the async culture? Is that where you started? Yeah. Yeah. So my whole thing was, it was a lot of like spreadsheets and a lot of Slack. And so we had no established project management system in place. So we started it out there just to develop, okay, let's keep, let's make sure that everyone's has a bird's eye view of what's going on inside the company. Like where are the projects, where's everything like that going on? And then um, I like to joke that lifestyle business owners are the original, develop the original idea of like how to work asynchronously because the whole idea of lifestyle business is how do we develop the process to the point where I can let somebody from the Philippines run this business and I don't have to run it. And I had a little bit of that background. I used to um, do a lot of work in e-commerce and drop shipping and that kind of stuff. And so because of that, I had read a bunch of books around how to do processes and SOPs and whatever. And I took that idea and I started looking into it and developed, started developing some SOPs within the company. Then I discovered Darren Murph and the work that he was doing at, at GitLab and essentially like jumped in there, 
figured out exactly what they had done and or under try to understand how they had built that. And I recreated it inside of the agency that I was working for. Oh, okay. All right. So extreme transparency, documentation, it's prime. It, it's not meeting first. It's There's an agenda for every meeting if it has to happen, but you don't necessarily lead with synchronous work, right? Yeah. And it was out of necessity for us because yeah. I think, I'm trying to think here, more than half of us were not in the United States. We're not in our time zone. So we had a lot of people in Eastern Europe. We had a lot of people that were spread out. And so we had to lead documentation first because a lot of people were not working when we were working, right? And so we needed to make sure that we figured out how to do that in order to make sure that we were working as efficiently as possible. And so, yeah, the we had meetings and stuff like that, and we didn't take it quite as far as I think GitLab takes it with the no meeting thing. But it was a lot about, hey, we want to make sure that we're not hampering ourselves by the fact that we're spread out all over the world. And so there was this big focus on asynchronous and documentation so that we could pass the baton at the end of the day. And we knew that when someone else was working outside of our working time, they weren't being held back. Yeah, because that's one of the added benefits as well, too, is you don't necessarily have to have core hours where everybody's available right at that particular time. Yeah, absolutely. So that enabled you really to move around. You weren't necessarily in one place. So is that where you started to grow your interest in digital nomadism? No, I would say that came first. Oh, um, okay. So I was born in I was born in Bulgaria, like I, like I told you before we hit record, and I immigrated to the United States when I was 10. And the really interesting thing about immigrating at that age is that you fall in this like weird category of immigrants. Because most people either immigrate with their parents when they're really, really young, like they're like three or something like that, or they move to a country for work or school way later in life. And so on one hand, if you move when you're really young, your personality hasn't really developed yet. And really the culture in which you grow up is the culture that you immigrate into. If you immigrate when you're older, basically your personality was developed wherever you were born and then you're, you're an immigrant in the new country. I was in the middle where... I very much remember growing up in Bulgaria, a part of my personality developed there. I had friends, like I have very distinct memories of living in Bulgaria, but then I came of age, so to say, 11, at the age of 11 and onwards, I was in the United States. To me, they feel like very distinct chapters. And when I was in the US, I was known as the Bulgarian kid. And when I would go back to Bulgaria, everybody knew me as the American kid. And nowhere was I just like at home or nowhere did I feel like I quite fit in. And at the same time, because I had this memory and this distinct experience of growing up somewhere else, I knew that the world was bigger than just Cincinnati, Ohio, where I grew up. And I just could not picture this idea of, all right, for the rest of my life, I'm going to live in this 100 mile radius of my hometown or whatever it may be, right? Most people, they hang out in that general space unless they move for work. But then again, they just hang out in that general area. And so I was, I was searching for something more. I dropped out of college. I got involved in startups and I ran a few startups here in the city, but was just looking for this idea of like, how can I have more of this global life? And then I heard the term digital nomad and I call it my Pandora's box because that gave me something to latch onto. And I put that into Google and I found thousands of other people doing it, right? And at that time, the movement was a lot smaller, but it was still enough that I was like, okay, I can do this as well. This is in like 2015. And so I started like looking for ways to do that. At the time, e-commerce was really big. So I got involved in that and just started figuring that out. And through that process, I figured out this is the future. I just don't see any way going back. People ask me, why was I confident that it was the future? And my way of saying it is, I'm a sci-fi nerd, and I just don't really see a world in which we are not like a multi-planetary species at some point. And I don't really think when we have bases on the moon or on Mars that we're going to be working out of cubicles. And at that point, yeah. in order Let's to work, not. we're going to have like, yeah. Can you imagine you go to Mars and you just end up in the cubicle? That would be the most depressing thing ever. But I also think if we're going to have a very rich economy that involves this multi-planetary existence, 
you're going to have to be able to do work over fast like differences in time. And so async is going to have to be something that we figure out if we're going to have an economy that spans the Earth and Mars, for example. And I was like, okay, this may take 30 years or 40 years or however long, but eventually this is where the world is going and I might as well get ready for it. Obviously, COVID sped that up by a whole bunch, but that's like why I said, okay, this is something that I'm very passionate about and this is why I want to exist in this space. Yeah. And it's not even just interplanetary travel. That's a little bit too far for people. But if you look at climate change, for example, with the forest fires, the drought, the flooding, all the various different issues that we're seeing already around the world, being able to migrate and work in different areas at different times of the year could actually be a reality in 10, 15, 20 years. So. Yeah, there's, I just think in general, the way that we work, we are, obviously, there's a lot of jobs that still require for you to come into the office or to do in-person work, right? Like medical, the medical field is not quite there yet. You still need to go and see the patient, right? So I'm not, I'm not uh, oblivious to that. But I think as an economy, we have been existing in this space that is not location dependent for quite a while, but we were still using like an industrial revolution model of work. And I just don't think that's the most efficient way of doing it. And yeah, I think the technology has been there for a while and COVID just kind of pushed it over. And it makes a lot more sense as well. When you mentioned climate change, there's also a lot of, there's a lot of different reasons why it might be a good idea for you to live in a different part than maybe like the city, like maybe go live in a small town or whatever it may be. So yeah, there's a lot of benefits. Yeah. And for me, I actually live outside of Toronto. So I didn't really tell you much about me, but I live an hour north of Toronto. I've always lived here and geographically it's 45 minutes, but as traffic grew and grew, my Mm -hmm. food actually ended up being like two hours each way. And so it allowed me to really stay where I always was. Right without actually having to do that commute anymore. That is a benefit too. Yeah, that's interesting in terms of the digital nomads. You mentioned that you like to work in Mexico a lot. What other areas around the world have you really pursued? Like where are the areas for digital nomads? I've been, I mean, I've been worked and lived and worked from a lot of different parts of the world, but my favorites are like my home bases would be Bulgaria and Eastern Europe. Obviously, I was born there, but also I was always like, I think that this would be a place where digital nomads would really enjoy being. And obviously, we've seen uh, places like Bonsko really blow up and Eastern Europe in general has become way more attractive to nomads and a lot more people have been going there. So for me, it's Bulgaria and Mexico are the two locations that I like to hang out a lot, at least in recent years. That's been where I've been going a lot. I think Portugal is great. Obviously, a lot of people are going to Portugal. I do think that we're probably on the tail end of Portugal being the place that it is. They are talking about ending that program. The prices have gone up. I just think that maybe there's some things that need to be figured out there if they want to do that more long term. But those are like my favorite locations. Now, obviously, Mexico is a big country and I've been in a lot of different places. So I don't know if that would be interesting for people in terms of what cities in Mexico I've been to. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Why not? Yeah. So I think my favorite place that I've called home, quote unquote, in Mexico is Puerto Vallarta uh, because it's Puerto Vallarta is very unique in that it's a big it's a it's not a huge city, but it has it's big enough to have a good infrastructure. There's a lot of amenities there that you may want. There's a lot of conveniences there that you may want. Good Internet. The airport punches above its weight class in that it has a lot of connecting flights with a lot of other U.S. or Canadian airports because it is like a tourist destination, similar to the way that like Cancun punches way above its weight class in terms of the airport. But then also the nice thing with Puerto Vallarta is that you have a lot of small towns around the bay there so that you can essentially work Monday through Friday and have really good amenities and Wi-Fi and then go somewhere and surf in a small Mexican beach village uh, on the weekends. And that's very easy. So that's why I like that a lot. Mexico City, obviously, is hugely attractive, but it's also starting to have, it's obviously, that attracts a certain type of person. There's 20 million people in Mexico City and that's not everyone's kind of ball game. There's a lot of pollution there too, isn't there? 
I actually don't think I think that's more antiquated. Uh, mm -hmm. They've okay. done a lot of work over the last like decade or two to fix that. It was really bad, but I think it's been improving. And if you check, like if you check on your Apple Maps, the air pollution, it's not like great. It's not like a mountain village, but it's certainly not as bad as it used to be. And I know from people who live there, they'll say it spikes. So it you can have really bad days there. It's also getting, I think there's, we've also seen like a lot of pushback on digital nomads in Mexico City because it's like raising the cost of living in certain neighborhoods. So that's some of the cons for that. I Merida is someplace that I've spent quite a bit of time as well, which is like the safest city in Mexico. The issue with Merida is if you stay there past March, it becomes, in my opinion, unbearable in terms of the heat. But it's a really cool city outside of that. Very interesting. Yeah, no, the the impact on tourism and pricing of digital nomadism is interesting to track as well, too. And it's there's a lot of debate around that. Like I like I I don't know is my answer with that because I understand both sides of the coin. Where there's a lot of locals that are saying, like, hey, this is you're starting to drive us out of our homes. Like we can't afford these rates because apartment like landowners would rather rent on Airbnb to remote workers and digital nomads and make more money than to charge less and rent it out to the local population. The pushback on that is that a lot of the neighborhoods that are being impacted by that are already like quote unquote gentrified. So they're already very touristy. They're already very expensive. So actually the impact on that is like the locals that live there are also high earners. And I understand, I don't know if I totally agree in a perfect world, that wouldn't be true, but I also understand that point. I think that the bigger issue is that Airbnb in general is becoming almost like location independent in terms of Airbnbs everywhere are becoming more expensive because you can charge high rates and everybody knows you can charge high rates. So it's almost like its own class, right? Where wherever you go, if it's on Airbnb, it's going to be very expensive or more expensive and very few are those places where that's not happening with Airbnb. So I think it's more of an Airbnb issue, not so much like the location itself having problems, if that makes sense. Cool. So do you actually, when you go, do you use the Airbnb? There are lots of other different companies that do that sort of service as well too. Yeah, it's, it depends. If I am going somewhere for two months, Airbnb is the answer, is the choice, or short-term rental platform like Airbnb. If I'm going somewhere for six months, I'll usually try to rent something off the local market. And uh, there's some places that where I've been where people have literally said, do not come in here and say, I'm looking for an apartment for $1,000 a month because we're not trying to spike the rate because the local market is used to $500 a month. And if you come in and start tossing around the fact that you can pay that much. We're worried that it's going to raise the rents in some parts. So there are like pop, like parts of the world that are, or nomad communities that are aware of this and are trying to gain it because it's their benefit as well. Their prices aren't going up, but also they're not raising the rates for the local population. So it just depends on the amount of time that I go places. Interesting. So this is an area of remote work that isn't my forte at all because I've always worked from home. I've lived where I live almost 25 years. So <clears throat> this is my stretch goal of what does mm -hmm. this look like for when I retire? My, my challenge with this is my husband is a contractor. So all his work mm -hmm. is done in person and his tools are here. And so while my work is portable, he is not. So I, have, mm -hmm. I don't think he's figured that part out yet. <laughs> there is a, so there, it's interesting because I always talk about these industries in which you obviously have to show up. And being a contractor is one of those, right? There was an interesting case study that came out of this construction company in Chicago. I don't know if you've seen this about how they adopted remote work fully. And they were essentially like, hey, we're all in on remote work. And the way that they use this is obviously the construction crews, the people that are building houses, they have to be there. There's no, they're not like sending robots to do it quite yet. Um, but the interesting thing is that they took the back offices completely remote. And what that allowed them to do is to reduce costs, obviously. Like they're like, hey, we don't have to have an office to keep like our accountants and like whatever in, in, in office. 
essentially the support staff went fully remote. They were able to go live wherever they wanted to. They were able to hire from like places where maybe people weren't charging as much. They were in Chicago. So I think their whole thing is like our accountants in Alabama and we pay her way better than like anywhere else in Alabama is paying her, but we're actually saving on like the Chicago cost of talent. The interesting thing that they found is that because they took their back office and support staff remote, they were actually able to expand to other parts of the country way easier because they just had to hire contractors in Indianapolis as opposed to Chicago and all of the operations and back office was essentially already set up and they were able to get that running way quicker. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So now they're essentially like, we can just have like, they have like teams of contractors now scattered all over the Midwest that all use the same back office, which is actually remote. And that's, I actually think the future of remote work in these industries that are not like tech enabled as much. If you get the operations right, then pieces that actually have to be in person, you can expand and build upon and do yeah. and That's really you interesting. you can charge better rates. Yeah, you can charge yeah. better rates because you're saving on office costs. So you can pass those costs on to your customers. So there's a lot of this like down chain benefits. Yeah. And office costs are, are a huge thing. There's a CEO that I follow. She was talking about the fact that they downsized their San Francisco office. They got rid of a million dollars off their bottom line because they went from 25,000 square feet in San Francisco down to, I think it was 2,900 and it saved them a million dollars. She didn't get the time frame. I assume it's annual, but yeah. And now the hopes are that money doesn't go to the pockets of the shareholders to improving life for and training for the remote employees to make sure that team is like working correctly at least the first couple of years so they can figure it out and pass the costs on to your customers so that you can outperform the other people yeah. who are not doing that same thing. Yeah, exactly. Like how can you reinvest that into benefits for the workers and make it a better mm -hmm. employee experience because you don't have that 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 expense any longer so yeah that that was exactly what i did i took that scenario and put that online and i'm like hey what could you use it for let's just let our imaginations go wild so, yeah that's cool so in terms of technology where do you see technology going to facilitate this even better what's your personal view of the future of work what's empowerment what does technology look like yeah, so it's interesting because there's a bunch of different things converging together. And that's where things get really interesting. There's a paper called The Nature of the Firm. And I think it was written in 1934 by an economist named Ronald Coase, who actually won the Nobel Prize for in, in that space. And what he predicts is that essentially a company wants to stay as small as it can because then it's way more nimble, it's just better in, in many different ways. However, a company expands when the transaction cost of working with outside talent becomes too great. So essentially, a company wants to stay really small, but if it's really hard and expensive and not efficient to work with contractors, the company will expand to then bring those people in internally. Where we exist now is that transaction cost has basically gone down to zero of working with outside talent. Because when this paper was written, you got to think about what did working with a contractor mean? It meant maybe having to move them and their family to wherever your headquarters were. How do you pay them? What is the, I mean, there's all of these questions. And now this has become really easy in comparison to what, to what it used to be. And so... The interesting trend there is this fractionalization of careers. We're seeing a rise in freelancers. We're seeing companies employ more and more automation and outsourcing inside of the workforce. Actually, I was having a conversation a few weeks ago with someone who is in the automation uh, field. They're building like custom uh, automation solutions for companies in Europe. And one of the things that he said was that the French government is actually discussing putting in a tax on automations within your business because they foresee that growing to such an extent that it's actually going to have an issue to the bottom line of the French tax intake that they have. Because you're taxing employees, there's not that many employees anymore because they're being replaced by automation. So that's the trend that's heading in, is this fractionalization, smaller companies that bring in outside contractors when needed, but get the job done with less full-time employees mixed in with automation and, and outsourcing. On the flip side, we have the blockchain. 
And the really exciting part about the blockchain that, yes, we talk about crypto and all this kind of stuff, but the actual technology of blockchain and why it's really interesting to this conversation is we talk a lot about remote work's ability to decentralize opportunity. I always talk about how my parents moved to the United States because they wanted a better life for us. And a lot of that had to do with economic opportunity. They can move to the United States and make a lot more money and provide a better life for our family. If they had to make that same decision today, they would have another option of, do we just stay in Bulgaria, but work for an American company? That's the vision. The reality of it is that there's still a lot of it's definitely still a lot harder for people from other parts of the world to get jobs with American companies because there's some level of stigma around that, right? Is their English going to be good enough? Should we pay them less? There's a bunch of these things that we don't, we shouldn't have because talent is talent and the value that they create is the value that they create and where they come from shouldn't matter. What blockchain allows you to do is to essentially unlock exactly that. And where I'm going with this is, I understand this is a very long answer, but already I know of companies that are in the works of essentially allowing companies to create entire projects and lay them out on the blockchain and allow anyone anywhere in, in the world to actually bid on either parts of those projects or individual tasks within those projects completely anonymously with the client knowing and having trust in that bid because they can see their entire work history because it exists on the blockchain. So essentially, they can hire anyone anonymously. They have no idea of their background, their gender, or anything like that. They have no preconceived notion of those things. So they hire completely based on the merit and the work history. And that, in my, op in my opinion, is this incredible opportunity because imagine living in some parts of Africa or Latin America or whatever it is and being able to truly charge American rates, like that to me is really exciting. And I think that's where we're headed in this future of work conversation. Yeah, that's huge for equality and just diversifying your workforce and leveraging talents that you would never know of any other way. Exactly. That's really interesting. And just to be clear, I actually worked for an American division of a Canadian company for 16 years. So, yeah, my a lot of my career has been actually spent working with Americans, even though I'm based in Canada. Yeah, there's not that much. I think America to Canada, there's not that much mm -hmm. like difference, so to say. But I think where we see a lot of like issues, right? For see a lot of issues happening is American companies hiring someone from Eastern Europe or using that as an example. And saying, oh, okay, you live in Eastern Europe, I'm going to pay you half what I would have paid an American to do, even though the value that you create is the same. And yeah. I hate that because to me, it's value is value and you should pay those people what that value creates for them, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's the big concern is like, why aren't you paying the value that you're creating, that they're creating for you? And also that's like a, that has like a negative effect on those people who do live in the United States and are forced to charge higher rates because their cost of living is higher. It can essentially create like a loss of job opportunity for them. Yeah, that's frequently an argument that comes up a lot is, you know, what's if you're working remotely, then people can hire anywhere. And that just means that the opportunity for Americans is going to go away. And to yeah. be quite honest, that's been happening for years anyway. But as to your point, like, if you have the skills and you have the ability to do that work, why shouldn't you be paid the same amount? Yeah. Why shouldn't there be a standard rate? And there is this idea of, see, this is why you shouldn't allow remote work to happen. Because now anyone can bid for these work and we're going to be like put out of work and we can't compete with these lower rates. And I understand that. The issue is that technology is that remote work is a representation of an advancement in technology. And the Higher technology historically in our civilization always wins. So yeah. when you try to fight against technology, you lose. So this idea of we're just going to pretend like remote work isn't an option and we are going to not allow anyone to hire from outside of the United States, long term is just a losing strategy. So my whole thing is I understand there's negatives with it. There's things that we need to figure out, but let's figure them out now because there is no, you're going to lose if you try to fight long term with technology. Yeah, exactly. It's like, wagon wheels to tires. So like you're going to adapt and adopt what's going to 
remove friction. So there's no real going back. I agree. So what's the secret to a winning podcast? You've been doing this for, what, four, almost four years now, you said? Mm -hmm. That's right. So is it really just interesting guests and specific marketing? Or what have you found to be the secret of an ongoing enduring yeah. podcast? It depends on how you define winning. That's uh, a good point. Because if winning means having a massive audience, that's one thing. If winning means, um, you know, just like having a podcast and staying consistent and improving your your skills in interviewing and in communication, that's one thing. And then also if it's like, hey, I want to grow a business off of this podcast, that's also another thing. And those are three different answers in some ways. So it just depends on which one are you most curious about in terms of what's like winning mean in, in that way. So what have you done? Yeah. So for me, my whole thing was like, I'm just going to keep this going for as long as possible. And there was no strategy when I got started. There was no, I was, I, my whole thing was I wanted an excuse to talk to these people that I was really interested in. Because if you reach out to someone who is, hey, I like, I really, this person is doing a lot of interesting things. I really want to get to know them, maybe become friends. I just want to act with them. And if you reach out to them with this, in with that pitch, like, hey, love what you're doing. Can we be friends? There's usually, they're, who are you? Like, why are you emailing me? This is weird. You have to lead with value. And when I was in my like early mid twenties and I was really trying to meet like these people that I found very in inspirational and that I wanted to connect with for me the podcast was a way to lead with value and say hey i have a podcast would you like to be a guest even though at the beginning there were like 20 listeners or whatever it was everyone likes to talk about themselves it's they enjoy it and so i was giving them like an opportunity to do that over time it's definitely become like more serious we're one of the biggest podcasts from remote work we're a top two percent podcast in the world so it's definitely changed a little bit over time when it comes down to growing a big audience, there's definitely and my podcast isn't obviously the like anywhere close to being like what some of these other people have, like massive millions of downloads a year and whatnot. We're not there. But I think it comes down to understanding distribution, understanding your market very well, having really big guests on that will then share the podcast to their audiences as well. And a solid dash of luck in terms of getting to hopefully maybe hit a nerve somewhere, hit some charts. Once you hit the charts, usually you get like a, you, it's almost like a flywheel because if you hit the charts, you get more downloads and those more downloads keep you on the charts and which gets more downloads and so on and so forth. There's a lot of that. Also like having a really good, like I said, distribution strategy on social media because discoverability on podcasts sucks. So you need to take that extra step of how do I distribute this content and then bring people back to the podcast. In terms of building a business on the back of it, I think most people do it the wrong way, where most people try to use a podcast to build an audience and then use that audience to build a business. I think it's better if you use the podcast for like lead generation where the guests themselves could become clients of your business. I think that is a far more sustainable route. And it means that it takes the pressure off of you to be one of the lucky ones that builds a large audience. You can have a small audience or no audience at all. But as long as you use that podcast as a way to get to meet and speak and build a relationship with your ideal clients, then that is a very feasible funnel, so to say. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've been, so I actually started with the smaller people. And what I really wanted to do is like when my job was restructured, I found that I just didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I started the podcast really so that I would have a, an avenue to actually just express myself. And the idea was where we just build off that and supplement what I was already doing on social media and give me a different yeah. channel. So that's how I started. But I'm building that into like a community and so like a community of practice really around a hyper remote strategy. Yeah, I think that there is something there in terms of establishing authority and creating these sorts of projects, which podcast, a podcast is like an example of a project like this that just like shows to 
helps you to establish authority and shows that you know what you're talking about. This is something that we've talked about a lot on the podcast as well in terms of the future importance of personal brands and how personal brands are something that these like entrepreneurs on social media were talking about, like Gary Vee. But it's actually something that a lot more people are going to have to really consider as the job market becomes more competitive, right? And you have to say, hey, listen, I'm the person for the job. And it's not just because you can see my resume, but because I've had a podcast about remote work and I've done a newsletter series with this company all about kind of like showing that you've taken action and showing that you've published and done these sort of things that sort of build up your credibility, I think are really important. Um, and I always tell people like, if you're just getting started into the workforce and you want to get a remote job or any job, start a podcast and interview the people that are behind your favorite companies or your dream companies. And you're immediately have a leg up on that hiring process. Yeah, no, it's great. And honestly, companies themselves are really starting to use podcasts as well. Like in employee engagement, a lot of companies are actually starting like internal podcasts that are not publicly available just in order to build up and build that connection with their employees and to tell their stories. That's a skill that really a lot of people don't have. I didn't actually realize until I started my podcast how challenging it is for some people who've never actually publicly told their stories to really do that. So it's that you're helping people practice their skills. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's the internal podcast thing is something that we even discussed in the podcast before as like a potential idea. If you were looking for a business to start, I do think internal podcast production is very interesting. There are, like you said, more and more companies that do this. Like Facebook has, I think, like a bunch of podcasts that they do internally. Um, it's very interesting. And yeah, there's like a little economy setting up in there. There's no podcast specific hosting platforms. It's very interesting. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Which are like protected because essentially if you're talking about sensitive business information on the podcast, you want to make sure that it's protected and secure. So you don't want to just put it up on as like an unlisted YouTube video or something. So yeah, there's like more of these like hosting platforms that are more um, secure, so to say. And that's a good point too, because how many internal memos are we seeing leaked from all of these big companies as well too? Like your internal communications are not necessarily always internal these days. so. That's a good point. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think we've covered an awful lot of different features. So I really wanted to appreciate you coming on the podcast, Nico. Thank you for sharing your wisdom about digital nomadism and podcasting in general. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I look forward to hearing more of yours. Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.